going on guys? I wanted to talk a little bit about drilling today. Drilling has been around since the beginning of machining. If you need to put a hole in something, there's no better way, right? But it's really not that simple. You have everything from old school, old school high speed steel drills like you see here, up to an insert drill like you see in my hand. And then you really go on to some of the most high performance drills which are these solid carbide with coolant through ports and we'll talk about all the different styles and what you need to know to achieve success. Alright, so let's start off with one of the first fundamentals of drilling and that's spot drilling. Because you always want to spot first unless you're going with one of these carbide drills which we're going to talk about in a minute. The proper spot angle is when the spot angle is greater than the drill tip point as you can see here in the first figure. And then an acceptable spot angle is basically a one-to-one -one ratio where the angle looks like it almost matches perfectly with the profile. That's going to be a nice even contact as that comes down. What you don't really want to see, especially when you're using a carbide tool, is a steep spot angle like this that's going to make the tips of the drill, this is the weakest point where I put the little red dots, if they contact first, there's a good chance you're going to chip your carbide. That's something you really need to remember if you're doing any sort of high performance drilling and even with high speed steel drills over time you might see decreased performance. But Now that we talked about that, there's another scenario that's pretty common in drilling where let's just say you've already got a hole opened up and you want to go through with a larger drill and make the hole just a little bit bigger like I was saying about those drill points, as your corners actually contact the material, what's going to happen here? One, you're going to get a piano wire type chip, and two, you're almost definitely going to wear out the corners of your drill right here at the points first. And that's something that you will see that over and over again. If you're trying to use this drill sort of like as a reamer, there's a reason why reamers exist basically. But yeah, let's see if I can get this to focus a little bit. If you're going into a part like this and you've already got your hole and you just want to make it a little bit bigger, like I say here, you really want to drill to the, your optimal size and then finish with a reamer if you need to open a hole up just a little bit bigger. I'm not saying you can't do it, but there's a good chance you're going to smoke the corners of your drill if you do so. It's also probably a good idea to kind of explain some fundamentals of drills. Let's see if I can get this to focus here. As you can see on this drill, this one's actually got a split point. You see that the cutting edge, that leading edge here, is actually the highest point on the drill. And then as you look to the rear of the flank here, it actually radiuses off. And that's important because you want your cutting edge to be the highest point and then when you're talking about anything with a larger drill, it's called splitting the point. You see this relief that's on the back margin here? It actually thins this point out to where there's less surface contact, making it able to drill through harder materials much easier, and it also does a little bit better establishing itself on center if uh, you're doing an operation where you haven't already spotted. But let's continue on here. Like I say, really don't want to use a drill as a reamer. We'll talk about reamers another time, but you really almost always, if you're going to go from a um, smaller hole to a much larger hole, and say you want to do a pilot drill, which that's common in machining, you'll go through with a small drill just to relieve the pressure off that point like we were talking about, and then you'll come in with the, the large drill and make your way through. As long as you're using most of the flute and distributing all those cutting forces and the heat along the entire drilled surface it's not nearly as bad. So let's talk about spot drills. Here I've got, this is probably the most common example of a spot drill. Let's make sure this thing's focusing. We have a high speed steel drill, spot drill here and this is commonly used to spot a hole for a tailstock which this one looks like it's 60 degrees, yep. But you'll see a lot of people use these for spotting for no matter what kind of drilling operation they're going to be doing and that's okay. 
a lot of times what you'll see people end up doing though is actually going beyond the drilled point and into this 60 degree angle up here and then you get into the condition like we were talking about again this third figure Let's see if I can get it to focus where you might actually be doing more harm than good if you're using a longer drill where you definitely need to spot your drilled center just keep this in mind you might want to switch out to something with a more obtuse radius or angle I mean um, one thing that you can do to overcome ever even needing to use a spot drill is to actually switch to a stub length drill and that's something neat about drills that if you're newer you might not know but there's different types of drills from stub drills to aircraft drills that are super long right so if you come in and you want to use a stub length drill like we have here focus this is actually short enough even though it's steel it's rigid enough that at this length the diameter ratio you actually would not need a pilot if you imagine sitting here trying to flex this drill with your hands it would be nearly impossible to get any sort of perceivable flex there even in machining conditions where you're hitting at high speed and doing hard drilling operations and hard metals this is going to be rigid enough to keep it self-centered which is pretty cool so for a low cost without even going to a carbide solution you can get a pretty high performance drill that doesn't even require that first operation of centering and then you go on to the other end of the spectrum here where you have a gigantic long drill I can't even fit the whole thing in the shot here right and if you were to actually contact your material and try to begin drilling with a tool this long say this is in your tailstock on your old South Bend lathe or something like that this drill point is gonna walk off on you an inch or more it's gonna be going all over the place you're gonna have terrible results you're really gonna have to do a centering operation before you ever begin to try to apply a drill like this but when we get to carbide we'll talk about something a little special with them so with a tool like this when you're actually doing your drilling operations you see this one has a whole lot of flute length here which is pretty impressive for this style drill um, here's another drill that's almost identical in size and sh pretty much every parameter about it except it has less flutes it's a little less length overall but if you can imagine here this drill say you're wanting to go um, full depth on it right up to my fingers here which you could do that right as you actually go in and out of your hole you, your peck distance which is the distance in between every time that you need to actually pause retract let the clear chips clear is going to be every two seconds basically with a drill like this you're going to be pecking 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 it's going to take you a long time whereas with a longer drill like this that actually has full flutes almost the whole length you can go in and out a lot further without those chips actually packing into the drilled bore there and causing all sorts of issues you'll have smeared finish on the inside of your hole you'd actually do damage to the tip of your drill when you are um, every time you're packing if you're going in and out the worst thing that you can really have happen is a chip get in front of the drill because the drill is really not going to be able to handle it the way the drill works it needs solid material to actually go in there and scoop that material out and bring it out along the chips and without that those chips if they get ahead of the drill it's just going to be smashing against the bottom of the hole bang bang every time you peck that's why pecking is really not ideal in something like a CNC machine um, you really want to be going with something like carbide if you're going to be running unattended operation because it's always almost impossible to actually ensure your chips are going to clear 100 percent of the time using a high-speed steel drill and if you have to peck which you're going to have to when you're doing deep hole drilling with an old school uh, aircraft steel drill bit like this you might run into bad results if you got a whole lot of work to do moving on here one thing we should probably talk about is tool holding if you're looking at something like a bridge port or a just simple drill press is just a drill chuck these things are really nice they're easily adjustable you don't need 50 
thousand collets like we're going to show you here in a second. These things are great, but they have their limits. They're really limited by their holding force. If you actually spin a drill in something like this drill chuck, there's a good chance you're going to damage the teeth inside because oftentimes the drill is going to be as hard as the teeth itself. And what happens when you have material that is the same hardness as what you're trying to drill or hold on to? They're going to meet in the middle and they're both going to harm each other. So that's something to keep in mind. If you know you're going to be doing some hard drilling and there's a good chance of it slipping, don't ruin your drill chuck. Something that's a little better solution is something like this drill chuck here, or I mean this collet chuck, which you can get all sorts of different collets from ER16 to ER40, everything in between, right? There, there's a million different kinds of collets and they're one of, it's one of the most versatile drilling or end mill, whatever you want to do to hold round shank objects, a collet is really a great way to do so. And this is probably where a lot of you are going to be, where you're going to start your career and end your career, <laughs> basically using a collet chuck. And there's nothing wrong with that because they're some of the best uh, tool holders in the industry and you can actually get R8 collets that are integral shanks and everything like that that'll go straight into something like your bridge port but just a little quick snippet on these normally what you would do is you would insert the collet into the actual collet nut then the drill then assemble the tool right so this one's actually got an integral R8 shank for the bridge port and we do have chucks for the bridge port itself that are just regular collets and bypass the need for any of this but if you want to use something like a tapping collet that's where this really shines or if you're trying to hold something a little special that you might not have the ideal collet for that's why we have this guy so the neat thing about drills is you're always going to be going along your strongest axis which in most cases when you're drilling is going to be z right if you're talking about an operation like boring, you're gonna be able to flex a drill like this very easily, right? But if you're pushing with it, poking, right? It's gonna be pretty strong along that axis. So you can have some extreme 70 to one, 70 inch long drill to one inch diameter drill bit. Just crazy length of diameter stick out ratios. One of the biggest things to remember with drilling is that Whatever runout you have at this end of your drill near you, wherever your holder is, if your drill is cocked on an angle in X or in Y, right, or a combination of the two and you're off on whatever kind of tangent, it's magnified at the tip of your drill. So my hand's not really moving in space, but do you see how far the tip is actually going? So if you imagine the same thing with your tool holder, runout or lack thereof is going to be everything in drilling. You want this drill, whether you're in a rotating scenario where the tool is actually spinning or the part is spinning and you're simply coming into it, you want perfect run out. And that can be a little tricky when you have a super long tool because you'll actually have gravity affecting the tip out here, throwing off your results, say you're trying to indicate along whatever flats you have or simply back at the head itself. And that's something where knowing your machine is already indicated true and your head is trammed in perfectly go a really long way. So drilling is really one of those topics you could go on ad nauseum, right? It, it could be something where I could talk to you guys for hours and hours about the intricacies of drilling. And we might do that over the course of a couple different videos, but I just want to give you a basic rundown. So if you don't want to sit through hours of uh, footage, you can basically get the gist of what it takes to drill a good hole. So you're going to see this in almost every shop. This old high speed steel drill with the Morse taper shank. This guy's been around since the beginning of time basically. Um, people have been running these since the 1800s. What is really more prevalent today is something like this guy here where you'll actually have a carbide insert in the center, focus, in the center here and then you'll actually have one on the periphery and both of these inserts while the center one picks up and starts actually centering the drill and creating that swarf that's coming out these polished flutes right you got your outside insert that's doing the same thing and ideally these would both be at the same plane 
so that you don't end up with a deeper hole on the outside than the inside or vice versa. But really what you're looking for, we usually go between two times diameter and five times diameter on a drill like this. This is a five times D making it a little less stable than something like this chunky guy in the back. That's a inch and three quarter, two times D I believe it is their OSG. And then with one like this, what you're gonna wanna do, this is a pretty rigid steel body, right? Which keeps the cost down. If this was solid carbide the entire drill, <laughs> just imagine the cost of something like that. You would barely be able to hold the bar, it'd be so heavy, right? It's just, just a lot of cost to do solid carbide on something like this. So they'll actually machine a steel body like this and it will have coolant ports right down through the center and then you got your carbide inserts and these are a really good low cost way to make very big holes in a hurry. And we have a series of different drills like this from I think our smallest one of this half inch up to two and a half inch diameter and these things really can plow through material and it's probably one of the most low cost ways to remove material because you can actually bore with these as well. You can take about 40 to 60 percent of this outside insert on your depth of cut and actually bore with it after you drill your hole which is really cool. Moving on we have a little different tool here. I wasn't super impressed with this one. This is actually a spot drill with a carbide insert and I think I'll insert a clip showing you my preferred one. that OSG actually makes and I've been having really good results with that but we'll actually use these for everything from spot drilling you can actually come in and chamfer with it in a rotating operation you could actually uh, engrave with these things if you wanted to they're really pretty versatile but yeah this one's not as impressive as the one I'll show you but these things are definitely a good option if you're doing a whole lot of spot drilling and chamfering and just everything kind of is one this is a pretty neat little thing that I made up a couple of years ago. This is a little focus custom uh, drill extension that I made for in the live tooling to clear the chuck jaws. So all I did was basically come in here with a center drill, drilled the body, came in, drilled it, reamed it, and just made sure everything was running very true, and then came in and put a couple set screws but this spins with very little run out and at this length the diameter ratio this was actually stiff enough to do the operations that I needed to without needing to make a second one just to hold a really short spot drill but I was able to get the job done on something that was a little special and it's just something you always got to remember if you're a machinist you can make your own tooling and I advise you to do so because it'll be a rewarding experience. Moving on we kind of are along the same principle here with something like a hole saw. What's neat about a hole saw is you're actually going to be able to remove large, amount, large amounts of material while actually remaining the core. And you see it's still following the same principle. You'll find these in everything from a construction site to a DIY kit that you got at Home Depot or something like that. While these aren't quite as, as quite as industrial of a solution as everything else on this table here, these things should not be discounted. I might have some footage I can throw in here of running a six inch hole saw through a large uh, sheet metal part that there would really be no better solution for it for getting a lot of work done in a hurry. But if you're not familiar with these hole saws, they can do a lot of work. The big thing here is the, they tend to grab, which if you're trying to use just a hand drill with something like this to run a large one, you might hurt yourself. These do work actually extremely well in something like a bridge port or a manual mill if you can really fine feed pulling that lever just ever so slightly at a low RPM and they really do a lot of work in a hurry. And then 
Let's move on to something like this annular cutter. This actually goes in one of our uh, portable mag drills. We got a compact, it's only six inch high mag drill. And these things, same principle, you create a center mark and then this guide will actually help you stay on center as you start coming down in. Again, you're gonna have a core remain, but if you wanna talk about an efficient way of drilling with uh, basically short depths but large diameters these things are fantastic and they're often overlooked annular cutters like this are actually extremely effective and it's a really low dollar cost per hole when you're producing with something like this and they actually run very very it's a clean cut they don't jump around and chatter it's actually a very good solution. Something to consider if you uh, have an application that looks like it might be fit that well. All right, so let's move on to something a little bit more near and dear to my heart. This was actually one of uh, the most difficult jobs I ever had to do, at least because of the machine that we had available at the time. Here is actually, this is called a gun drill, right? So this has a coolant port on the back where you can actually plumb coolant to it and it's just a steel body a tube that's basically crimped in with a brazed carbide tip on and there's a lot of different grinds you can do to get better results with these but it's not the most high performance option but people have been using drills like these for many many years and doing having great results in all kinds of difficult applications. If you look at a hole that you're like, man, how did they get that through there? Chances are it was this over the past, I don't know, 100 years, probably they've been using gun drills like this, but this is a little bit smaller one. We've actually got one that's definitely not gonna fit in the frame here. Just kind of do a pass through. <laughs> this one was a pretty difficult job we had. It's more like a samurai sword than a drill. Here we got it in the shot. I've got it on an angle hanging there, but same thing. You can actually see the marks I had here where I actually had to go in with a shorter drill into the part, and then I had to remove the shorter drill, place this drill into the part, then actually swing the rear end into the tooling block inside the lathe. And I had all these marks. Okay, I need to drill this far, then pull it out a little bit and then go the rest of the way. And I had a custom holder, which I'll show you probably here at the end of the video, that I could adjust the rear to aim the drill. And I had a 4,000 PSI pressure, pressure washer hooked up to the machine, actually running it while I was drilling. It was kind of a <laughs> everything we had to throw at it to get, these jo get the job done quickly. And yeah, this was a heck of a job. And this was probably one of the... Uh, first jobs I had where we had to get that far outside the box which I think I've heard of other you see the drills a little damaged here I mean we put this drill through hell <laughs> but yeah I've heard, I, I think I have heard other people say they thought about running a pressure washer while they were doing deep hole drilling but yeah we've actually done it because one of the most important things you can do when drilling here's another one you can see kind of what happens when things go bad drilling this one's all destroyed. This one did a lot of holes though. Sometimes you push your luck too long with the uh, operation and it bites you. But as long as you got your life out of that tool, oh, <laughs> it's better than uh, not pushing hard enough and really leaving things on the table. But uh, one of the most basic principles of drilling is RPM is kind of... Uh, it's important, but it's not nearly as important as feed rate. If you're not feeding hard enough to break a chip, and I might see if I can find some slow motion footage from in the past of us doing some drilling.
if you aren't feeding hard enough to break that chip as you're feeding into your material, you're going to get stringers. And that's real bad when you're running a CNC machine with a lot of forces, a lot going on, all these chips, if they're not being broken up into little Caesar sixes coming out of here, they will pack the flutes and you could have a scenario where the drill actually stalls inside and the machine's still trying to push and the machine's destroying itself and this thing's starting to melt down, it's turning molten red, everything's glowing. Okay, you get the idea. <laughs> yeah, it can get bad. Just remember that. If you feed harder, there's actually less chance of things going bad. If you're tentative and you're scared to actually run a drill like it needs to, a drill like this, if you try to go in there and be real tentative and don't give it the feed rate that it needs, those chips are going to pack in here and you're going to have stringers hanging 12 feet off this drill by the time you get 8 inches deep on this thing. All right, so let's go on to the most high performance drills on this table, and that's the solid carbide ones like you see here. This is actually a stub length drill. Well, you could actually go a little stubbier than this, but I mean, this, this thing is solid carbide. Carbide is much, two or three times at least, even with the most poor performance grade carbide is gonna perform light years better than your steel on rigidity and performance, right? This guy here, this one doesn't even have coolant ports, but you really don't need it if all you're going to be doing, we're actually going to use this as a spot drill, right? So when you're using a carbide spot drill, you will actually have a greater angle than the drill that you're going to follow up with. Maybe you'll use 140 degrees on the tip, whereas your actual drill you're going to use afterwards is 135 degrees, right? So you'll start with this and you'll go at least one times the depth, usually one to one, one and a half times the diameter of the hole that you're gonna go with. This will be the exact size of the drill you're gonna follow up with, right? And then what you're gonna do, come in here with your high speed pilot, then you're gonna come in with your extra long drill. This could be 10 times diameter, this could be 30 times the diameter. It could be a super long one like these gun drills on the table. You're gonna come in with this drill spinning very slow after you've already established a nice true hole, focus. You've established a nice true hole with the stub length that we just talked about. You feed in, you've already got the coolant turned on, you're going real low RPM. You feed just down to where you finished off with the other drill. You crank this guy up to the full speed that you're going to be going at and you just go. There's no pecking. This, these high pressure coolant ports on the tip here are going to be doing all the work for you. I need to try to get this to focus. <laughs> Alright, there we go. Yeah, these coolant ports, and this is actually pretty cool. I have some footage of how they actually get these uh, ports into the carbide, and it might not be how you expect, but uh, yeah, the coolant is going to act with hydraulic force to actually help break those chips and force them out along the flutes. And unless you have through spindle coolant, and that's why when you're shopping for a machine and you see that maybe $10,000 coolant option, you're like, man, I don't know if I'm ever gonna use that. Well, if you're gonna be doing much drilling, it's gonna pay for itself in a hurry because there is no better way to drill even moderately deep holes than with through spindle coolant because it's gonna be leaps and bounds more efficient than if you had nothing but uh, flood coolant trying to get it to go all the way around these flutes to the tip of the drill. It's not going to help you eject those chips. It's not going to help cool the tip. You really need through spindle coolant if you're going to be doing a lot of drilling, boring, anything that you're doing deep like that. Even if you're just machining a slot in a part, if you're going say uh, two inches deep with a small tool in a slot, that high pressure coolant's gonna get places that you just can't get externally. So keep that in mind. Like I was saying with that 4,000 PSI pressure washer, if you are not, if you don't have some sort of through spindle capability, you can uh, actually buy, they have adapters that will actually go on the outside of your tool holder with a bearing that will actually spin and you can actually um, plumb your coolant directly to these special tool holders. So some basic guidelines when you're talking about a 
carbide drill like this, if you are at three times diameter, so imagine this drill was one inch in diameter and you want to take a one inch drill and drill it three times its diameter, so three inches deep. You're going to be able, able to do that with a carbide drill with no spotting. You can do five times diameter, you can do six times diameter, you can do eight times diameter with solid carbide drills. But once you get beyond eight times diameter, it's almost certainly better to create a established hole that's on size and you know is perfectly true, perfectly centered before going in with your longer jobber length drills or your super long drills like 30 times D. And like I said, you're going to go in there with the RPM low, go into your pilot hole. We're not even necessarily spotting, we're actually creating, we're simulating a board hole basically. Everything's perfect, guiding this drill into its uh, desired location just before the bottom of the hole, crank it up to speed, full speed, feed all the way to the bottom of the hole, retract with, at low RPM, right? Turn your coolant off once you're just about to come out of the hole and you've got a great hole. But it's like hitting a bullseye and if things are not perfectly aligned with your drill, you're, going, you're not going to hit a bullseye at the other end of your part. You might actually drill out the sidewall of your part by the time you reach 30 times diameter deep. It's that critical that things are absolutely perfect with alignment. So when you're looking to run a super long drill like I'm holding here, one thing that I actually did was I drilled holes in the face of the block here. It already had holes drilled and tapped in the top, so I could actually steer this tool. I'll just stick it in there quick. I could actually steer the tool up and down by either tightening the set screw back here, which would bring the tip up, right? I could go into the face here and tighten and actually tip it down, go into the front and loosen the back, tip it that way, right? And then the big thing here is that the turret already being in alignment. So if you picture putting a coaxial indicator in the chuck over here, taking the tool out and going inside the bore of this block and actually establishing X and Y are perfectly on the center because like I said, run out on this is going to be extreme. What is very minimal run out here could be very bad run out by the time you're out at the tip. When I was running this drill in particular, I actually had to insert it, slide it back in, feed down, enter into the part, then bring it out to its max drilling depth, tighten it down, check the alignment, right? which is hard to do when you really can't move. I had to know my block was already perfectly in place. And what I actually did to ensure that and really put myself ahead was I put a sleeve inside of the holder, and I've done this several times in the past because it worked out great, put a boring bar in the actual lathe chuck, spun the boring bar up at high speed and bored the block in place. And then these were really not needed. I ended up using these early on and going to the guide where I actually bored in place and recorded my offset. So that's a little tip for you too. Uh, sometimes you got to think outside the box. Concentricity, rigidity, stability. <laughs> I don't know what other words go so well with uh, deep hole drilling or drilling in general. You follow these basic rules of thumb like spot, knowing when to spot, when not to. You almost never want to spot with carbide. There's a good chance you're going to do more harm than good unless you follow the principles I told you about with uh, deep hole drilling and using a greater spot angle than your actual tool you're going to use itself, 140 versus 135 on the tip angle. Um, rigidity, when you're talking about a tool this long, it, it really doesn't matter. As long as the tool is not so cartoon-like 
in length that it just simply folds under the weight of itself and twists off, which that can happen at extremes, but you see how long this tool is here and it's still plenty rigid to do the job. Um, you should have success. We can go more into depth if you guys want to see more on drilling or something in specific, let us know. And if you want to see something next in the comments, let me know. I've got a lot of ideas for videos, but we could kind of jump the line if it's something that's really interesting that you want to see. Thanks for tuning in and remember to like, subscribe, share this with your friends. Let them know they can go on our website for free manufacturing education. We have speeds and feeds, buying guides. We got all kinds of stuff on there. We have all the thread parameters for metric and standard thread. It's all on there. It's all free. Go on, use it, and let us know what you want to see next.